Noam Chomsky once said, a lot of countries either break or go against international law. Keep this in mind as we discuss today with one of our favorite guests, the Canada-China relationship and what does it mean for the future of geopolitics. My name is Dr. David Wallalu. And my name is Dr. Ross Stewart. And you are watching Geopolitics in Conflict. Like we always do, Ross, we told our viewers that from time to time, we're going to have some very interesting guests that's going to come on our show. And today, we have one of the most We are, we are going to fulfill our promise. Our promise for that. So why don't you introduce our guest, okay. Ross, please? For those of you that don't know Richard Curlin, he's an attorney at law with an emphasis on immigration in the provinces of British Columbia and Quebec. In addition to practicing law, Richard is currently the editor-in-chief of LexBase, a monthly publication providing current immigration policy and practice information. Richard is also lectured at different institutions, including Canadian Bar Association. He's a graduate of McGill University in Montreal. And as we've gotten to know him, he is, through these media, he has made many appearances on radio and TV, including Newsnet, CBC, Fox TV, uh, and New Zealand television, among others. And just to put this in the right frame, may I tell people what your hobby is? Please. Keeping Ottawa honest. honest. Hmm. Honestly, when I read that, I laughed out loud. I understand the challenge you must be up to with that. Well, yeah, they're okay. only hmm? sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> they're only 24 hours in a day, and I need them all. <laughs> Uh, well, we want to thank you for being here. We truly appreciate you carving out time for us and welcome to Geopolitics in Conflict. So, My pleasure. So without wasting any time, we're going to be uh, digging deep into the issues of tensions between Canada and China. And as we all know, with the case of Meng Wanzhou, which you are very, very, very familiar with. So. I'm going to start by the first question, uh, Richard. Hmm. Did Canada break international law? Well, hmm. international law? I don't think so. Um, uh, that's a great first question <laughs> because how does international law uh, figure into this extradition case? Uh, the magic is that the extradition agreement between Canada and the United States is not a matter of international law. It's just that, an agreement, and importantly, an unenforceable agreement. Uh, that's the key here. Uh, it opens political solutions uh, and compromise positions uh, in, in, for this particular extradition case. So in terms of international law, uh, Canada, frankly, abides by uh, the tenets of uh, binding international law as far as it concerns Canada. And this extradition case, I don't think's run afoul of any of that. Wow. Really? Wow. Yeah. That is not to say <laughs> they crossed the line <laughs> under Canada's <laughs> domestic law. That's entirely oh, different. Let's go there. So yeah. How so? How, how did oh that? my goodness. Okay, I, I'm going to bore you with the real story. Oh, we'd love to hear and, it. And um, I have been on this since literally day one, day one, uh, when uh, on the tarmac arrived uh, Meng Wanzhou. Why? I regularly monitor high profile cases uh, for Canadian immigration policy uh, and our national media. Well, <laughs> I'm not unfamiliar with the personalities Huawei, the tension between Beijing, Washington, Ottawa, and the importance of this particular traveler who wanted to vacation in Mexico. And so, yeah. <laughs> what happened? 
Here's the nitty gritty that you're not going to read in the newspapers. That's right. This was a pre-election year in Canada, federal election. And because of that, our communication structures modified. Normally, operational procedures when a high profile visitor enters Canadian airspace or the Vancouver International Airport, the minister in Ottawa is given a briefing. Not so during the pre-election years. It gets bumped up to the prime minister's office. What happened? Well, they knew it's a CFO of some company from China who is the subject of an American arrest warrant who will be part of the extradition process. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Do we proceed? Prime Minister's office. Problem? It was on a Friday, late, oh. where this stuff comes in. And who's making the decision? Bunch of kids with little or no training. Support Didn't staff. Know who she was. Junior support staff. And it's weekend, so Friday, Saturday, but they do have an A plus when it comes to political communications. The reasoning? We can position Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on the global stage as a mediator, strategic peacemaker between Washington and Beijing. Our guy can go on nightly broadcasts and obtain political capital in a never ending flow with no political opposition. And we look great. Go for it. They had no clue who they were putting in the net. Oh, None. No. Now, <laughs> and to complicate things, the Attorney General, Minister of Justice, one and the same person, wasn't signing off on this extradition request. Okay. Trained lawyer, she's not far from where I am here in Vancouver. Uh -huh. And she's looking at all of this and the evidence. I'm not, I'm not signing this. This is a rule of law thing, and this is politically poisoned. I'm speculating on her thinking. Yes. And, yes. and uh, when she had a second incident with SNC-Lavalin, a very large multinational engineering Canadian firm, she wouldn't sign off on a kind of plea agreement for what they did. They violated international law. Prime Minister replaces the Justice Minister. To Mr. Lametti, on day one, what does he do? Signs off on this extradition thing with China. Oh. So those are the national political dynamics. I wanna bore you with one more little fact. This is not boring. For, this for is something six, we've never seen before. Well, exactly. For the first six months of this case, Prime Minister Trudeau, the younger, was standing in Parliament, House of Commons, saying, I can't interfere in this because of the rule of law. The rule of law does not allow a politician, a minister, to wade in mm -hmm. to this case. Wrong. Legally wrong. And for four months, I was handing out by email copies of Canada's Section 23 of the uh, Extradition Act, which expressly plain words gives the minister the power to revoke that certificate that starts the extradition process with no reasons, no explanations can be done at any time. So contrary to the prime minister's um, legal thoughts, <laughs> the plain wording of the law contradicted what he was telling the House of Commons. In fact, the statute in accordance with rule of law, expressly gives when it comes to extradition, not criminal, extradition, the power to shut down a case anytime, anytime. And so this is, that's, that's, your, that's your framework for all of this. Uh, and uh, here's what happened at the airport. It's rather telltale. <laughs> and, yeah. and I have experience with, these guys at Canada Border Services Agency, CBSA, they are highly trained, professional, 
they've been doing this for decades. And Vancouver International Airport is where they put some of the finest agents and officers because that's responsible for 25% of Canada's intake of foreign nationals traveling by air. So CBSA gets together with Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP. And here's why. <laughs> On the one hand, under our immigration law, when you come through, get off the plane, go to your immigration interview, no lawyers allowed. There is no right to counsel. So they can examine you, examine your goods for customs and immigration purposes, do whatever they want. You're allowed. Mm -hmm. RCMP, mm -hmm. once they arrest you, you have rights. You have right to counsel. You have the right to say nothing. And, and on and on and on. So if Ms. Meng goes to an immigration interview, no rights. If she gets arrested, she gets rights. Facts on the ground. And folks, I was sitting in court for the last two and a half, almost three years, hearing the testimony with my own eyes, with my own ears. Here's what happened in court. RCMP and CBSA, before she arrives, had a little meeting. Hmm, if we arrest her, she clams up. So can we not arrest her or delay it until we get what we want? Hmm, on questioning by lawyers for the defense, turns out that's exactly what they did. Oh, they oh. knew that she would have constitutional protection if she was arrested immediately. You're gonna like this next part. The judge, the judge had- was ordered, Judge Holmes? Uh, there's a, another. Another uh, one. It, 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 judge Holmes was presiding over all of this. Uh -huh. but I think it was also just, Justice Holmes, but I'm not sure. It doesn't matter, frankly. The arrest warrant that was issued had not a standard form, a personalized form with giant font letters, <laughs> immediate, Arrest, immediate arrest. She gets out of the plane and RCMP officers are there. CBSA officers are there. Defense lawyers ask <laughs> both of them, like, okay, let me see if I understand this. It said immediate arrest, right? Yeah. Well, did you have authority to immediately arrest her, you guys? Yeah. Well. Was she immediately arrested? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean? RCMP, you didn't arrest her? No. Uh, later we did, <laughs> after her immigration interview. CPSA goes, well, we don't consider that immediate. And they ask, well, what is immediate? It, like um, three, four hours? Yeah. Two days? <laughs> Can be. A week later? Yeah. So by ignoring the court ordered immediate arrest, they violated her constitutional rights. This is the Ooh. defense argument. And there's going, it's gonna be picked up in a couple of weeks in court in Canada uh, to see where that goes, but it gets worse, <laughs> believe wow. it or not. So now before she gets off that plane, yeah. they, they had eyes on the ground where she took off. <laughs> they got, the intelligence guys were out there uh, and they reported she actually got on board the airplane to give that like 10, 12 hour lead time, flight distance for Canada to prepare on the ground. And they did. What was the number one priority for CBSA and RCMP? They were holding a bag, literally. And the first thing they did when she comes out of the plane is, do you have your cell phones, any computer equipment? And they put it in this bag. On examination in court, well, what was that about? The Americans wanted it. Excuse me? <laughs> yeah, they wanted her cell phone and the passwords to the cell phone. Uh, and they wanted us to immediately put 
her equipment in something called a Faraday bag, which okay. blocks signals coming in or out and prevents bad things from happening. So here's the thing. It was <laughs> clearly established in court that the purpose, the number one objective was to tag, get the cell phones for the Americans for use by FBI uh, in American proceedings. Now, back it up, back it up right to when she was sitting in the plane. <laughs> Plan one, RCMP, CBSA, they're on the tarmac on the tarmac in the airport where the plane is arriving. The plan was, we're gonna go into the plane and arrest her right in her seat. And then they realized, well, wait a minute. No, no, we gotta change that plan because uh, no. Let's arrest her when she walks off the stairs onto this tarmac. Then there, a communication of about 90 seconds ensued with it seems the FBI, oh. <laughs> the, plan, the plan gets changed. <laughs> no. And they tagged her when she goes from the plane to the tarmac. And then, you know, those corridors, she comes out and that's when they grab the phones. When was she arrested? <laughs> After a couple hours into this interview, oh. uh, do you have the passcodes? for your phone. Can you just write that down, please? Okay. As soon as she did that, you're under arrest. <laughs> oh, so good. If, wow. she didn't, if she didn't cooperate, would she have been arrested? Well, um, yeah, there was a- Oh, they're gonna be arrested no matter what. For okay. immediate arrest, there's just no question. She was not yeah, getting out yeah. of that airport and under oath they said and admitted there was no way she was leaving that airport not under arrest. Okay. Mm. And then <laughs> wow. what happened, what happened caused an eyebrow arch, I think, <laughs> in the court. Well, what happened to these passcodes? Oh, we made a mistake. We accidentally gave that to the FBI. And we shouldn't have done the, that. As that was the RCMP, Richard? Yeah, yeah. Which means RCMP were working for the Americans? Well, four. That came up also in court. That's brilliant because that was... Uh, a, a point that uh, everyone took great pain saying, we don't work for, for the FBI, it. not for mm -hmm. the FBI. They're not paying us. <laughs> we don't take instructions from them, but it just seemed to work out and they apologize for their wrongdoing and administrative error. Uh, and uh, um, there you go. So that was her situation when she came in uh -huh. and the defense arguments have spaghetti plastered the wall with these constitutional abuse arguments, mm -hmm. any one of which is sufficient to shut down this case permanently. Really? Wow. Yeah, um, it's nasty. Yeah, let me go back to, because uh, there's one key point you mentioned there, Richard, about the, 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 the cabinet. Now, isn't a decision like this, at least to my knowledge, how governments operate, usually in a situation like this, Want to be a meeting for the cabinets that the decision will be made anonymously or? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I mean, you know what I'm getting at. Right? I sure do. Yeah. And, and in this, in this, you have to go back to Trudeau the elder. Now, now, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau yeah. was yeah. my neighbor for 20 years. Oh <laughs> my God. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that guy, yeah. genius level. Uh, you're not gonna. You don't see humans. Oh, like, I read about. I read about what he did with the Chinese. Yeah, and um, he is the Relations. one who kind of changed the nature of how Canada is governed federally by centralizing control into the person. I, I call it the person, not the office of the prime mm -hmm. minister. Okay. And so it may be in cabinet which diffuses responsibility for a delicate decision to a group of people rather than one. One. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in this one, it's not the prime minister's call. It's not the call of cabinet. It's the call of one person, the minister of justice or attorney general, one in the same person. Yeah. But that person was appointed by the prime minister. And, and 
if, if the prime minister says jump, you just say how high. Oh, wow. And, and they, they don't need a written instruction. Uh, it's very clear uh, what, it, what needs to be done. Uh, and in this one, uh, politically, because this is an excellent point you're making, it's in the interest of the prime minister and, and cabinet to have the court make the decision because of President Trump. Why? <laughs> well, <sighs> let me focus on HSBC. Okay. The bank in the Hong bank. Kong. The bank in Hong Kong. I'm going to wind the clock back three years. HSBC, uh, Netflix has done a documentary. This is the bank for the Mexican drug cartel. This is the <laughs> bank for Sudan, Myanmar, Iran, you name it. The bad boy neighborhood. This is the same bank over the last like five years or so. They have paid literally billions in fines for violating banking laws, fraud, violating anti-money laundering acts, violating the terrorist financing act, you name it, <laughs> they paid money for it. They were on probation. They uh -huh. had a deferred prosecution agreement and basically in plain speak, they were on parole. So they got caught <laughs> dealing with Iran in violation of American sanctions. I followed the money. I went into the public registry of lobbyists. Who pays whom for what? Yeah, yeah. HSBC doubled up the oh. paid lobbyists for the Department of Justice in Washington. Well, what did they get for their money? <laughs> so I was really curious. If they were caught, and, and they were charged along with Huawei for this stuff, if they were caught, what is the smartest defensive move you can make for HSBC? Oh, wait a minute. We were duped. Uh. <laughs> we didn't know who these people were. We didn't know how they dealt with Iran. We, we had no knowledge. And, um, you know, they committed fraud. They violated our international reputation. Uh. And by doing that, which is a, a legal genius move on their part, you kick the soccer ball down the road in terms of years, because you're not going to proceed against the bank when you have all of this stuff happening. They got a defense and they got to sort out the defense, which means they can operate in the United States until this is done. And that was their goal, operate mm. their bank in the United States. So, the evidence, where did the evidence come in the Huawei uh, uh, affair? From the bank. The bank gave Washington this PowerPoint presentation of a meeting in Hong Kong in a tea house. <laughs> Why didn't they show this before? Well, they, they showed it during this trial. <laughs> and so oh. it, it got flushed out. And so when Washington came to Canada initially for this extradition. Washington gave some, not all, of this PowerPoint presentation, leaving out the good bits yeah. that would exonerate her. Washington, in writing, said there may have been some junior executives that were aware that they were dealing uh, with Iran, which is not illegal in Canada because Canada doesn't have Iranian sanctions. Uh, yeah. But the, the company, the bank didn't know. These were just junior one-offs. Well, that was proven patently false in court in Canada. It was the top level that was aware. What happened next? President Trump negotiating with China on trade agreements and, and uh, communications issues saw, because it was publicly reported, this Huawei thing, this arrest of Ms. Meng. And when, bingo, I got me a trade pawn. And so uh -huh. that's why uh, President Trump, President of the United States, wades into a Canadian extradition case. Never seen it before. 
ever. And says, May, basically, maybe I can fix this. We'll, we'll see how the trade thing goes. And Canada was afraid of President Trump. Canada was negotiating free trade agreement. And I know oh, this might come as a talk oh. to you. President Trump mm -hmm. was thought of as somehow unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And so- Oh, shocking. Canada, people yeah, I know, I know, it's a first. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so Canada didn't want to raise the wrath of President Trump and see uh, falsely imposed duties, tariffs on Canadian goods and services. Right. So Canada did a big one uh -huh. and went along with this ride. China retaliated against Canada with sanctions mm -hmm. on Canadian economic goods and services. So here's the good news. When President Biden sat down with Prime Minister Trudeau, which is normal. The first stop of a new American president is always Canada, with one exception, President Trump. Uh, <laughs> they, 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 the top 10 irritant lists included this case. But Canada had a hidden ruby in the box, the vice president. Now, the vice president grew up in Montreal. Oh, she grew up in Canada. Her mom was teaching at McGill University. She uh -huh. was going to high school, my rival high school. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the, so she knew full well everything there was to know about uh, how this dynamic works. You know, this is the inside story that we simply couldn't get any other way. Yeah. So what's really going on here? What, um, well, uh, realistically, bad luck. Just no. a series of miscalculations and errors. Um, everyone wants this to go away, uh, all parties. Uh, and I think President Biden has now found a path uh, to make things better. I, I'm also an old China hand. I, I have mediated before between, um, over time, uh, between Canada and China at the ministerial yeah. level. Uh, and um, I know China wants to make this go away. Uh, they, no one has um, uh, perfectly clean hands uh, in all of this. Uh, and it, it's just a race to try to get things settled down. The urgency now, uh, in addition to the looming court decisions, in addition to the uh, resolution of HSBC, get them out of Dodge permanently. Yeah. Um, there is uh, the photo op, the photo op. Uh, so uh, what would you prefer if you're Prime Minister Trudeau? Dealing during your election with two detained Canadian Michaels in China, yes. or in Vancouver airport, warmly welcoming back your two Canadians to Canada, oh, yeah. which is better optics. So I, I think everyone's on the same page here. Um, it's, um, it's just got tragic human consequences, uh, which is sad. Uh, China, unfortunately, had an unintended consequence by its uh, tactical uh, detention of two Canadians. Uh, Canada has taken the time and effort to form an association of like-minded countries to, in the long term, uh, prevent uh, this kind of detention in future. And essentially, that requires encircling China diplomatically. Oh, and uh, that I'm sure can be sorted out. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, will it be, Richard? Would it be sorted out in case Manuel Joe is set free? Well, I used to say, what's going to end first, COVID or Meng Wanzhou's case? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's the same kind of timeline, frankly. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it, it could work. Um, uh, there's, there's question marks. Uh, even if the extradition case folds, will China release uh, the two detained Canadians? And if you're asking a question like that, yeah. there's kind of trust element uh, on someone's part. Uh, so um, I'm not sure how it'll play out there. Uh, but what I do see is damage. Damage to oh, yeah. Trump, damage to the economies of three countries, mm -hmm. damage to short term, medium term, diplomatic and, and cultural relations. The evidence internationally is crystal clear. The more trade, 
the more economic growth, the higher per capita incomes, the more democracy, uh, and the more people benefit. This case negatively impacted all squares on the chessboard. It, it's wow. got to go away. And, and that was going to lead me to uh, my next question before I turn it over to Ross, is the idea of how international corporations now is going to be perceived in Canada. In other words, will they uh, uh, always view Canada as, you know, because a lot of corporations operate in Canada because there is a favorable environment, uh, a country of law has always been known, uh, respect of law and so forth. And now with this, uh, some have argued, and I had some conversations, uh, Richard, with some uh, insiders here that this, this, this said this could tar tarnish and it's already tarnished the Canada's image on a global stage. What do you think? Well, yeah, well, um, first, uh, USA. Best buds in the world have been, are now, always will be. Uh, the little uh, uh, bump in the road yeah. was uh, one presidential administration. That's come and gone. Uh, so I think inevitably, uh, best buds remain best buds. You know, it's like it's like a family. You can have dispute. You can say things that normally will tear apart, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but not in a real family. That's that. Those things happen. When it comes to China, it's kind of the same long view from China. I remember meeting a delegation from China at, in, in 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 Ottawa National Headquarters of of some department. And uh, it came my turn to chat. All I could talk about was Norman Bethune, a Montreal physician, national hero in China because he went and risked his own life. He died uh, to help people. Uh, and he's the model of um, doing things for others at the cost of yourself. And so that is Canada for much of China. This case doesn't change it. I think the perception is, what can Canada do? If the United States says, do this, what choice does Canada have, really? Uh, and that's kind of understood. Uh, the, even though she's, uh, Meng Wanzhou is living in um, not unpleasant conditions uh, relative to others, that's not it. You've taken our superstar, our icon. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, uh, now in hindsight, if they had grabbed Bill Gates' wife, I don't think Bill would have been too upset with the no, he was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying. I'm saying. No, he won't. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's at that level. You, you, you can't do that anymore. And you shouldn't. You, you go after a company, you don't go after the uh, human. An individual, yeah. right. And that's fundamentally wrong. Fundamentally, they sh the Americans should not have done that. You even had a former Canadian prime minister publicly saying this extradition treaty is not international law enforceable, not enforceable under Canadian law. Forget the case. <laughs> they can't sue us. Don't do it. <laughs> and now there's been a change of culture in Canada at the elite level. Before it was, you can't give in. You give in, you're just inviting more incidents like this. Well, the tune has changed. Just send her back. It's enough. Uh, so yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, it, it does have impact, uh, but long-term impact? No, this is gonna go away. Yeah. And that was, uh, this one exactly was, uh, was uh, uh, reclaimed by a statement from uh, David Mulroney, the former yeah. Canadian ambassador to China. I think yeah. it was an article published in 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Are Canadian concerned. ambassadors, the Canadian ambassadors who have been to China? Yeah. I wouldn't say in unison, but a significant number yeah. have gone public saying, come on. Exactly. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. I was so taken by his statement because uh, to me it was, you know, <clears> if he didn't, sort of 
uh, he weigh his words. I've, I've yeah. read some of his statements and so forth, but this one was right on the mark as far as where things are headed yeah. with China. And let's be clear, Canada is well aware that China operates uh, streams of agents, mm -hmm. uh, streams of activities aimed at sensitive Canadian infrastructure in technology, intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Canada knows it. Is Canada stopping it or pouring resources? No. It's just part of being a free and democratic society and a little competition is good. Uh, so that's not changing. Two things are changing socially. Uh, I don't know what's worse. Uh, I think the COVID thing is worse. Um, the same way you had the Trump base, you kind of have that cohort functioning in Canada. And um, COVID was preached as China created, China induced, China spread. So we have experienced an alarming increase in hate crimes uh, against Asians right here in Canada. Oh, yeah. and at the same time, the extradition case is oxygen to that fire. Oh. Uh, so oh. there you go. Uh, they're spying, they're doing this, they're doing that. They've detained our Canadians, blah, blah, blah. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, uh, it'll pass. It'll pass. Yeah. Richard, you willing to go out on a limb here? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> What's going to happen and when? Uh, yeah, well, the good news is that I've been consistently wrong on that question. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll put great color for the Yeah, but I, 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 so my pride is in tatters. So there's no harm, <laughs> no foul now. What I see happening, uh, the critical juncture is going to be between August 3rd and, say, Labor Day. Uh, yeah. uh, Madam Justice Holmes is. <sighs> I can't describe it properly. I've spoken with people who worked with her before she ascended to the bench. Um, they're, I think she's at the very top in terms of uh, judicial capability. Uh, and uh, that speaks volumes here. Yeah. And so uh, unpredictable. You don't know how it's going to play out. But uh, she's got enough on her plate uh, to um, pull the plug. I'm sure she also has her eye on two points in time in this case coming up. Uh, there's, of course, the decision, yes, we send her uh, to uh, a committal stage. Uh, I'm going to decide whether to put her on the bus to the States or not. Yeah. And that's the juncture where she can accumulate all of the legal arguments and come to a decision either way. That's the first thing. But the second thing is more important. She reads the statute. She knows Section 23 of the Evidence Act. And even though she judicially comes to a conclusion, you're hooped. She knows full well that the minister can intervene at the last minute, theatrically, to say, you're not getting on that bus for whatever reason we think. Here are some of the reasons. Mm. One, when we started this, we didn't have the information we have now. Yeah. We didn't know what the Americans were feeding us was questionable, if not patently false. And we wouldn't have signed off on this had we known. Two, the charter breach, the constitutional rights breach is new. And we're not going to stand for that. We cannot allow RCMP and CBSA to get away with stuff like this political problem just it's it's like inside baseball but Canada's intelligence system and law enforcement like RCMP all without exception have independent oversight third party arm's length but not Canada Border Services Agency and that's been a political promise for years. And yeah. because of the absence of that, the failure to deliver on a political promise, I think uh, CBSA could not have gotten away with what they did in this case. So too, the minister can come to that conclusion. And at the same time, they say, not only are we not extraditing, we have decided now to provide oversight monitoring to CBSA, and they reap a fortune in political capital by doing so. <laughs> wow. wow. So that's, uh, 
that's how I see it uh, playing out. Um, uh, my my death concern all this time. I don't know if you're aware. <clears throat> her health, not oh, good. No. Never oh, has been. Um, <laughs> can, you know, the, uh, can you imagine if, for natural reasons, she were to pass on Canadian soil? Oh my oh, God! Can you think that through? I mean, there's no coming back from that. Conspiracy theories would blossom. Oh yeah. Relations oh, yeah. with China would harden, would have to harden due to domestic matters. Don't forget, this case is front row center on uh, China's national television system. Mm -hmm. So it's a, uh, she's, <laughs> that's my number one concern from the get go, uh, that she'd have a health incident. Uh, fortunately, that's not there. So. All of this taken together, the predictions are, if I had to summarize, and I hope I'm not wrong again, <laughs> she's not going back uh, and she'll be in good health with a return to China. Richard, my PhD is in psychology and I'm looking at two plus years of being under house arrest and the emotional trauma this, and stress that's put on this woman and then there's whatever the situation is with the two Michaels, which I'm not very well informed about. Yeah. Do you think that she has grounds, eventually has grounds to sue the Canadian government? Well, why would first, yeah, why, why would she sue? To get money? Doesn't she doesn't need money. money. She just needs her freedom. <laughs> <That's what I'm laughs> so, yeah. you know, and then, uh, or to make up some point. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm on the same page. I have zero training uh medically in that area but mm -hmm. i i am uh aware of uh post-traumatic stress syndrome i was watching for the telltale signs and i can tell you they they, they had blossomed fully by month nine uh oh, you can cool. see that uh, kind of depression the the shock the pauses the the yeah. face um, and with some questions the spin yeah um, and uh, I am sensitive to that. I, I had um, a half hour chat with the spouse of one of the two detained Michaels recently. Yeah. And um, exactly what you're saying, I said, now, please uh, ask Canada to commit to sending a pro, a PTSD specialist to China, be at the door when your husband's released for immediate treatment. So I'm on that page. I'm well aware of that. And not just her, uh, not just uh, uh, Meng Wanzhou. It's a family. Yes. It's the entire family. And uh, like I watch when her husband comes or, or other close family members. Wow. Um, it's a nightmare. And, and people don't realize it. I've watched them try to camouflage, cover up, do all of that. But... Um, um, I used to do profiling when, you know, when I was young and that sort of thing. Um, not at your level. I remember Mossad telling me, relax, you're, you're good, but you're not PhD level, maybe master. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, the, I'm sensitive to that stuff. Uh, and, I, and I see what's in front of me and I read it and um, I try to uh, provide uh, information to counter. Uh, hope is critical. Right. Uh, and uh, maybe I've been wrong, uh, but I've been on the side of hope and positive outcomes. Yeah. Uh, I take your point rather seriously uh, and from square one. Yeah. Well, as, I've, as I've watched her, uh, she looks empty inside. That's yeah. tragic. It's also guilt. And it could kill her. I mean, I really get that. Yeah. Well, the, her blood pressure, as you know, but um, it's, it, I think a lot of it is guilt. She, I, I, I don't know because I have, I make sure I never have direct um, uh, communication with her. That's, that's a no, no. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the mindset is I've caused damage to my family. I've caused damage to my oh, dad. Very Chinese. Very I Chinese. have caused my company, my, my family comes to spend money and taking their time. Plus I, I, I can't do proper mother things right as i'm expected to do it's my fault why did i take that trip to mexico yeah 
So yeah, it's, oh. it's all there. The whole recipe is on the plate. Yep. Uh, there's a very substantial Chinese community that I'm associated with here in Dallas and learning Mandarin. Mm. And looking at this, at the whole family structure, something I couldn't imagine until they rubbed it in my face and said, everything you said about, about Mang is that's how she operates. Yeah. She's Chinese. Yeah. And, uh, and it, it's, 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 it, yes, it's family and all of that, but more importantly, she has a duty to the nation of China. She knows it. Yeah. Now you try wearing that mantle and see how far you get. Uh, so uh, is she a disgrace to the nation? No. Um, and um, what I'm focusing on is the post-release strategy. Uh, the number, I do see a glaring weakness on the China side uh, in terms of their uh, media communication strategy. It, it is not Western style. Yeah. Uh, and it, had it been played differently, significantly differently, I think public opinion uh, would demand her immediate release. But um, uh, they went um, typical China. If you have a hundred <laughs> pegs, you take out a hundred hammers and hammer a hundred pegs <laughs> to guarantee you've covered every possibility. Yeah. No. That's not the way to run it in the West, certainly not in Canada and the United States. Uh, and um, we have a sympathetic female chief financial officer of a global company. And you can't work with that? It, it, it's not nepotism. Right. It, this is ability because uh, there are other family members. It's a complicated, extended family situation over there. And uh, she has done good things. And none of this pops up. In my view, she was the victim in all of this stuff. She sure and was. that part was, it, they get a fail on how media was handled. Uh, so there's nothing that can be done. It's water under the bridge. But on a go forward, you may want to focus on a kind of key point in time. And I'm wandering into another area, but for good reason. So I, I, I explained it to some people this way. Um, I, I have buddies who went through the medical system, became professors or just practitioners, whatever it is. But <laughs> when uh, a person gives birth, you'll have the physician eating a chocolate bar, standing outside. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it, for the hours and hours and hours of the horrific process, and they pop in for those four minutes when it counts. Yeah. Something's going to go wrong. They're there. They just bing, 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 and then pack it off for the uh, juniors to, to mop up, so to speak. In this one, what will be critical for diplomatic relations for at least a decade to come between China and a heck of a lot of countries is the decision of the court. Is she going to pop up and you're going to see a meme like the Hitler jig from World War II dancing yeah. up and down? Uh, yeah. yeah. Or tears of relief head down into the car to the airport. How that three minutes are going to be structured will likely determine public attitude for a considerable period to come. And that's no thought has been given to that stuff. What you don't want to see, and I was absolutely shocked. It was out of a movie. Uh, Ming Wangzhou arrives literally on the steps of Vancouver Courthouse the day before one of her hearings, flashes the victory signs with an entourage grinning like she's going home what is that and that was played and played by coincidence uh i think it was a cbc journalist captured it yeah mm. uh, you know who's running the show how does this happen so um uh, folks in beijing or wherever kind of play attention to the end game 
because that three minute spool you'll see for a decade, it'll crystallize in emotion and public opinion across continents. And unless a Western style media communication strategy is developed and implemented, even if she wins, China loses. Uh, oh, that would be very. I, I don't see them doing that, just given how the nature of the culture. And you've been there, Richard, so you know what it's like. I mean, I, I take the example of the speech uh, Xi Jinping did during the centennial anniversary. And, and you know, when he mentioned the hammer and the steel wall and all that. Well, of course, the West took it differently. That's yeah. like for us when we say, well, you have a cold feet. <laughs> you know, yeah. the interpretation. Um, I mean, I see your point exactly whether, but I just don't see how China might change that because where they are going geopolitically right now, where China is, the thinking about the next few decades, especially for the 2049, where yeah. they want it to be, to them, it's kind of, they are in a point where, why should I have to compromise my own uh, principles, if you will, to meet the demands of the West. Oh, I agree with that kind of thinking um, on that time of timeline for that kind of issue. All I'm talking about is three minutes. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to take a victory lap? Do it when the plane lands in China. Uh, that's it. Then you hold the parades, the speeches, the medals, right. whatever you want to do. Right. She certainly earned uh, the position of national hero. I don't, I don't see any doubts about that. Uh, but um, I get to, what you're, I get what because this thing is going to be viewed billions of times. Yeah, literally billions of times. Yeah, and she's also done. Uh, if if there's a court decision upholding her charter rights, once again, very wealthy people pave the way in Canada for uh, the rights and protections of everyone in Canada, citizen or not. Uh, and and uh, she, she, that's a contribution to the Canadian legal system uh, that people really don't appreciate yet. Uh, and the um, 200 million visits a year to Canada, 200 million entries a year, uh, every single entry will be affected by her case. People will have rights now or they didn't before. So oh, wow. that counts. Wow. That counts a lot. This can be really managed well for everyone concerned. And I don't see China losing face. I don't see um, uh, any compromise or giving in or being dominated uh, by anyone uh, when it comes to her, her eventual release. Yeah. Uh, it, it is time to kiss and make up. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That is very interesting. Well, Richard, we don't. We thank you so much. We truly appreciate that. I don't want to take up too much of your time. And uh, oh no, no, I, I'm you. grateful. You know how intim it's so intimidating to talk to two doctors. I don't mind sharing that. With you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have analyzed you. I saw your problems. I really get what's going on. Here. <laughs> well, but because we do intend to have you back again here, because we have a lot to uh, cover with you, given your vast experience. So. But I, uh, I, I personally, on behalf of all of us here, which truly, truly appreciate thank you, you so thank much. You. Thank you. <laughs> Take it's, care. It's, okay. it's, such a, it's such a rarity to get the news behind the news. Yeah. What's really happening? Yeah. Thank you so much, Richard. That's correct. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, to our viewers, we hope you enjoyed uh, uh, those insights from Richard because you can't get them anywhere else. So we are very thankful to, to Richard. And we look forward to having him again. So as always, uh, uh, if you want to leave us some comments, make sure to subscribe, share, and like. And we look forward to seeing you next time. And as always, stay informed. Till next time. Bye-bye.